Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, you who with the Father and the Son is glorified, we pray that that you, God, would be pleased with our worship this morning. Not that we earn your favor, not at all, but we want to be drawn into your presence. We want to be made aware of the work that you are doing as you are doing it. So Holy Spirit, lead and guide and direct as we consider this prayer of Jesus. Help us to hear it as if he were praying it over us in person here and now. And if there's anything human in this time, we pray that that would just be left by the wayside and only that which is from you, Spirit, would remain would change us to be more like Jesus. And so, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever made a pinky swear? A pinky promise with someone? Often when you're little kids... Something, I don't know, especially binding about that, but a promise, whether pinkies are involved or not, are assurances of character. The one making the promise is basically saying, I will do whatever I can do in my power to fulfill my word. And yet I, I read a story this morning about a, uh, a couple who's having some difficulties because the man promised the woman that they would travel in their new year in 2022. And the man got wrapped up in work and did not keep his promise. And the woman was upset about it. And so this year for 2023, she has already booked her vacation. She has already got it planned. And if he can get free and would like to come along with her, well, that's just fine. But she's going. She is not depending on him to keep his word because he didn't do it last year. Now, granted, some of those things may have been in his control and some of those things may not have been. But the fact of the matter is that humans, when we give promises to one another, we, we base our promises on our intentions. We mean to keep our word. But sometimes unexpected things happen. With that in mind, consider this. When God makes you a promise, he's keeping his word. Because there isn't anything that's going to happen that God isn't prepared for. He's in control of it all. So when God says, I will do a thing, he will do that thing. You can bank on it. God makes a promise. We've got to remember that he is in control of all circumstances, all of our circumstances. I, I mentioned uh, that little line from Proverbs about how we can determine our course. We can think, this is what I'm going to do. And yet, the Lord actually determines our steps. He knows where we're going to go. We can trust God's promises far more than our own. With all of that in mind, Please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 17, and we are going to continue working through Jesus' high priestly prayer. We looked at verses 1 through 5 last week. We'll now look at verses 6 through 12. This is on page 1680 in your pew Bible. Jesus prays for himself. Jesus prays for us. 1680. John chapter 17, we'll start with verse 6. So let's read 6 through 9 to get us started. I have revealed to you, I'm try. I'm sorry, let me try that again. 6 through 9, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. 
for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. You see, Jesus came to do a work. He mentioned it in the passage that we looked at last week. The work is not his sacrifice on the cross. That is God's gift to all of mankind. The work that Jesus came to do was to make the Father known among us. And in doing that, Jesus' work accomplished two things. The first thing is Jesus' work accomplished our acceptance of God's word. Jesus' work accomplished our acceptance of God's word. I'm reminded of, of a passage in the Old Testament where the people have been a, away from God for a long time. They probably had a, a few rotten kings, one after the other. And the nation as a whole had kind of backslid. It, it wasn't the, the passage from Jeremiah that we read, but it was they were in a similar state. And as the priests were cleaning out the temple, they found a copy of God's written word. They found a copy of the law and the prophets. And they brought it to the king, and the king was like, oh, well, this is great. Let's gather all the people, and we'll read it. We'll just learn everything that's in there. And so they gathered all the people, and they read the law. You know, the laws, that's kind of, a, that's a lot. And so they were there for a long time. And the more the priests read God's word to the people, the more the people realized, we have really wandered away as a country. Oh God, we are so sorry. And there was weeping and they tore their clothes and threw dust on their heads. And God, we, we have really messed up. And it's not that God wants us to rip our clothes or throw dirt on our head. But God very much wants us to recognize that we tend to wander away. And he wants to draw us back. So, verse 6. Jesus says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now, I don't know if you caught this. When, when we say the word Jesus, for example, um, we, we miss something. The original word in Aramaic, Jesus' name, is pronounced Yeshua, like Joshua. And Yeshua, that name, means God saves. Jesus' very name means God saves saves. God comes among us, makes himself known. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus lived to show us the Father. The, the word that they obeyed was confessing and following Jesus. If you were to turn to Matthew chapter 16, there's a conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples just outside of Caesarea Philippi, and he asks them, who do people say that I am? And they come up with all kinds of, oh, they think you're a seditionist. They think you're a rabble rouser. They think all kinds of things. Some think you're a prophet. And then Jesus asks them, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, and I give Peter a lot of guff in this pulpit. I know that. But this time, Peter steps up to the plate and cracks one all the way out of the stadium. He says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. You are the fulfillment of all of God's promises. You are God's made flesh in front of us. And Jesus' answer was, ooh, got it in one, Pete. Good for you. In fact, you didn't figure that out. God gave you that word to say. That's the beginning of the church itself. Not because Peter the man was the guy who said it, but what was said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And when we say that same thing, we are following in Peter's 
footsteps. We are a part of the greater church of God. His name was revealed, verse 7. Now, now consider this, verse 7. Now, they know everything that you have given me comes from you. So here's the thing. Jesus was not a radical teacher. He was not just giving alternative concepts. Often that's how the, the world sees Jesus, but he's not saying brand new things. What Jesus ends up saying is very, very, very old things that the people of God have forgotten. You know, guys, the whole point of the law, the prophets, the writings, the Old and the New Testament, all of that together, is so that we would just walk with Jesus, walk with Father in the garden, the way it was all the way back in Eden. That's the original intent. That's what Jesus called for the whole time, is to reconnect with the Father in, in relationship. Not that we would come to know God by a list of do's or don'ts or thou shalt or thou shalt nots, but the kind of conversation that you, you have with someone that you desperately love and you want to make happy and you're both hungry and you're driving on your way and like, where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? That conversation. Well, how about here? I don't know. I'm not feeling that one. And I don't know if it, this happens in your family or not, but in our family, that's a 15 minute conversation. We need every minute of the, the road to Moses to figure out where we're going to eat. The back and forth relationship that's how we're supposed to walk with God. Look at verse 8. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. The, the, the words that Jesus gave us are words of truth, words of righteousness, of peace, and reconciliation of life and salvation, the gospel, all of that. And all of that is in the Old Testament. We might have to dig around and find it a little bit, but God is constantly telling his people in the Old Testament, walk with me, spend time with me. I would rather your hearts be invested than your sacrifices of sheep and cows and birds. I, I, to obey is better than sacrifice. Just come to me and say, I, I'm sorry, Dad, I blew that. Can, can we fix, can you fix this? Yes? Oh, well, can we go for a walk? Yes? Well, let's do that. That's the original intent. That's what Jesus called us to do every day, to, to walk with him. Verse 9, there's a, a thing that he says here, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but those you have given me, for they are yours. Now, it's always that the, the best way to read scripture is to recognize that the guys who actually physically held the pen, the original authors, Jesus, God, God is the one who inspires you, who puts that word in their hearts, but they're the, the guys who write the stuff. The original authors have an original audience. And they have an idea in their head that they want to com communicate to the original audience. We are eavesdroppers. When we read the text, none of us are the original audience. And so Jesus is saying to the 11 disciples, remember, they've just had the Last Supper. Judas left to go get his mob. They are now walking on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And... Jesus is praying for them. I pray for them, these 11 guys, the original disciples. God has chosen those original disciples. That's the original group for whom Jesus is praying. Now, here's the thing. We get grafted into this. All of these original disciples ended up sharing the truth that they knew about Jesus with the world and People came out of the world and trusted Jesus and became followers of him themselves. That's how we got there. God knew this way before the foundation of the planet, but we didn't. We knew it when we heard the gospel for the first time and responded to it. 
Or maybe like me, you heard the gospel for the hundredth time and then responded to it. I pray for not the world, but those you have given me. And that's where we get to say, Jesus is praying for me. Because God, think about this one. God chose you. Specifically had you in mind. Knowing every time you would fall down on him and still it's like, no, this is my kid. I love this kid. This one is mine. God has chosen us. Except made us able to accept God's word. The second thing that Jesus did is in verses 10, 11, 12. So let's look at those. Verse 10, all I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. When I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. No one has been lost except the one doomed to destruction that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus' work accomplished our acceptance of God's word. Jesus' work accomplished our protection by God's will. Our protection by God's will. You see, in verse 10, Jesus says that the disciples saw the Father in the Son. And gave glory to God. This is the idea. I, I mean, th think about it. You remember the old song? He's got the whole world. He's got the whole world. He's got the whole world. He's got the... More than just the world. He's got the whole... Amazingly, probably large universe in his hands physicists tell us that the the universe is expanding at a rate of whatever miles per hour. I love that thought because the, the really expanding into what? God's hand. God created the entire universe. That's my God. Impossibly large to to imagine. We, we call that Transcendence. God is transcendent. He, he's so big, you can't even wrap your head around it. And yet, Jesus, the second part of the Trinity, took equality with God and considered it, no, nope, I need to become one of the, these people. I need to become a baby. So he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant and became flesh and dwelt among us. Talk about imminence. Talk about, think, think about this one. I, I love that song, Mary, Did You Know? When she's holding the baby and realizing she is holding the God who created the universe and he needs his nappy changed. Imminent, intensely personally close at the same time. That's our God. We see the invisible father, what he's like, because we're able to look at the visible son. And verse 11 talks about protection. I'm not going to remain in the world any longer, but they're still in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, Yeshua. It doesn't technically just mean God saves. It's, it's Yah saves. Yah, Yahweh, God's name, will save. He, he makes himself present and known. That word protect, to, to keep, to guard. All of those who are in Jesus Christ, all of those who have recognized God's promises and have said, yeah, I want that. When we live in those promises, we are bonded together with God and with each other. Verse 12, when I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name. The name that you gave me. God has a promise. God has a plan. God has a purpose. 
Now, I know this is true in my life. I know it's true in lots of people's lives that I've talked to. There are times when we screw up, and sometimes we screw up big time. And we might think, God's just got to be done with me. I, it's just, it's got to be over. I mean, how, how could God forgive that thing? And I've had the conversation where people like, I couldn't possibly, and I'll invite them, please come to our church. It's a neat group of people and there's often coffee. Come hang out. Oh, I couldn't go to church. You don't want me in church. The ground will open up and swallow me whole if I go to church. No, you are not that bad. I say to these people. But boy, oh boy, they want Jesus. They're just not sure what the cost is going to be. We we see here about Judas, the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. It it seems awful that, that Judas is chosen to do a rotten thing. And, and frankly, I, I look forward in the, in the book and I, and I see the conversation that Peter has with these people who are saying, you know Jesus, don't you? And he, he denies them three times, just like Jesus said he was going to do. And at the end of the third time, it hit him what he has done and he walks away in shame. So then Jesus comes back to life, goes and finds Peter and restores him. I've always had a what if in my mind. What if Judas had waited just another 12 hours and seen the risen Christ? I, I, the Jesus I, I know that I see in text, I don't think Jesus would go to Judas and Peter standing next to like, well, I'm not talking to you, but you... I, There is nothing we can do that is so bad, so heinous, so terrible and awful that God would just say, I am completely done with you. I don't want anything to do with you ever. God has a promise and a plan and a purpose to bring you home to him. And so we don't worry about the events of the future. We trust the word of the one who writes the future. Let's pray. Now, Lord, here's here's the truth of it. I I say this statement that we don't worry about the events of the future, and, and I know that that's a good ideal. And yet, sometimes we worry anyway. Even though you you say, right in the book, be anxious for nothing, but in all things make your requests known to God. So God, hear our request this morning. Help us to not freak out over what 2023 has for us. Or 25. Or 35. Some of our little ones here are going to be around in 2070. I'm, that's not going to be a problem. I wonder if some of these little babies are going to see 2100. That'll be cool. Most of us here will be long gone by then, but you hold the future. No matter what, you hold the future. Now, I would hope that you would decide that 2023 is the year when you say, all right, new heaven and new earth time. Everybody comes home. Reset button is getting hit. That would be be awesome. But since we don't know the day, or the time. Help us to trust in you who invented time. We ask this in Jesus' name.